We have looked at a variety of spatial scales over the last day and a half, uh, down to the level of individual cities and uh, plantations. To the, uh, last session, we're going to uh, take a little bit larger view into cosmography, into meteorology, uh, and looking at uh, uh, something a little broader. And it's interesting that uh, I began my discussion talking about meteorology, and we will end on the same note with Lucas Schultz. But anyway, I'm happy to uh, introduce Matthew Edney at the University of Southern Maine, who will be talking about positioning the Earth in the 18th century, mapping the cosmographical and terraqueous flows. Thank you. You want some handheld? This is fine. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. <laughs> uh, and as ever, um, thank you, everybody involved in doing everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this project um, has stemmed from a realization in editing volume four, co-editing volume four of the history of cartography. Uh, with 20 minutes, I don't have time to get into the history, but if you want to know more about where it is, where it's at, where it's going, um, and especially if you've got some money you can maybe donate to me to give to the project, uh, I'd love to talk to you. Um, but in talking, in reading through a lot of entries, um, a couple of realizations hit about stuff, and I want to talk to you about, about that today. Um, by the way, we have some stickers, perfect for putting on laptops, and uh, they're over by the circulation desk. The other thing is that this book, this, uh, this project, uh, comes from, in some respects, part of a book that is coming out. Advanced copies, I'm sort of promised, will come out the 12th of March, so less than a month from now. If you want to buy a copy at 20% off, there are forms back there. Okay, enough of that stuff. So, world maps are archetypes of the global imaginary. The famous Hereford Mape Mundi <coughs> exemplifies both how world maps enable readers to see the world in ways that cannot be achieved in reality, and how world maps embody their culture's concepts of the nature and organization of the world. Cross-cultural comparisons celebrate how non-modern or non-Western world maps differ from those of the modern West. Such comparisons are common and engender the conviction that modern Western maps reveal a highly mathematized worldview, what with their map projections and coordinate systems. The touchstone of this conviction is the continually misunderstood projection created by Gerhard Mercator Mike for his world, world wall map of 1569. Yet modern world maps are not just about the mathematical recreation of the, of the Earth. Like all world maps, those of the modern West conceptualize humanity's relationships with the phenomenal world, and perhaps also the noumenal as well. This presentation identifies several symbolic configurations of the Earth in modern Western world mapping and traces their shifting importance in Western culture from the 16th into the 19th century. This long historical perspective permits a reinterpretation of the supposed Enlightenment reformation of mapping as entailing not the final displacement of imagination by experience in cartographic practice, as has commonly been argued, um, but rather a shift in cultural dominance from a cosmographical imaginary to a terraqueous one. These two imaginaries were equally mathematized, but they differ profoundly in their connotations. So my presentation is in three parts. First, I trace the rise to dominance in the 17th century of the cosmographical imagery, imaginary, which is to say an understanding of the globe as an integral component of the cosmos. I then explore the development of an alternate global imaginary focused on what 18th century commentators sometimes called the terraqueous globe. This is the globe itself, its lands and its waters, studied as an almost entirely autonomous entity. Finally, before some concluding remarks, I delineate the triumph of the terraquean and imaginary. So let me begin with some actual reasonably hard data. Rodney Shirley's admittedly flawed Carter bibliography of printed European world maps of 1700 suggests some interesting patterns. In particular, Shirley made clear 
that by the end of the 17th century, world mapping was dominated by double hemisphere world maps on the stereographic projection. 48% of the 540 maps listed by Shirley, whose form can be identified, and more than 70%, 70% of the specifically 17th century world maps were all on the stereographic projection. By contrast, world maps on Mercator's projection accounted for just 8% of the entire data set and just 12% of 17th century maps. The massive increase in the number of published world maps after 1600 stemmed from the expansion of, Dutch of uh, printed geographical discourse as epitomized by Dutch atlas production. But why should so many of the world maps in this newly expansive discourse be double hemispheric stereographics? The projection does have a distinctive property. It is conformal. It preserves angles and therefore shapes so that its meridians and parallels intersect at right angles just as they do on the globe itself. But this property was also shared by the Mercator's, proje by Mercator's projection. The answer lies in the 16th century recasting of mathematical and geographical education around cosmography, the study of the Earth within the geocentric cosmos. Indeed, the terrestrial sphere was understood to be influenced and geometrically structured by the celestial sphere. The Earth-Sun relationship defined the five Aristotelian zones, the frigid poles, the torrid tropics, and in between the temperate latitudes, and the distribution of fauna and flora therein. Latitude and longitude originated as a means to locate stars in the celestial vault, and it was the ancient Greek philosophers who transferred meridians and parallels from the skies to the globe. Moreover, Latitude and longitude were determined by astronomical observations. By the end of the 16th century, cosmographical studies promoted the publication of matched pairs of celestial and terrestrial globes as the basis for geographical and mathematical education. The armillary sphere in between physically modeled the geometrical equivalences between the Earth and the heavens. In his highly influential Cosmographicus Liber, first published in 1524, Peter Appian included the Speculum Cosmographiae, or Mirror of Cosmography, which mapped the northern hemisphere of the Earth on a stereographic projection, which is to say, in the same manner that astronomers had since antiquity, mapped the heavens. Appian added folvales, the little movable paper bits, to turn the Earth into an instrument in the same way that the astrolabe instrumentalized the heavens. This is the first printed terrestrial use of the stereographic projection. These cosmographical concepts came together in the innovative world map that Rumold Mercator added to a 1587 edition of Strabo's geography. The division of the Earth into two east-west hemispheres had already been accomplished by some geographers so as to emphasize the old as opposed to the new worlds. Rumold now applied the stereographic projection to this division and further signaled the cosmographical connotations by including a small armillary sphere in the upper spandrel. The map gained wider circulation and influence when Rumold used it to help complete his father's atlas in 1595. The cosmographical re resonance of the equatorial aspect stereographic double hemisphere world maps was established beyond doubt by the practice, first marked in print as early as 1610, of adding the line of the ecliptic as copied from terrestrial globes. The ecliptic, which is the line traced out by the sun as it, moves to, as it appears to move from solstices at the tropics through equinoxes on the equator, was crucial for using terrestrial globes to model the sun's movement. Celestial globes fe featured the ecliptic as the basis for one of the two systems of celestial coordinates. And both kinds of globes mirrored the ecliptic in the zodiacal calendars placed on their horizon rings. The presence of the ecliptic on double hemisphere world maps, even if highly formulaic, intimately connected the Earth to the geocentric cosmos.
Moreover, the line of the ecliptic was added only to double hemisphere stereographic world maps. In the highly allegorical practices of 17th century Dutch geography, the spandrels left between the two circles of the hemispheres and the map's rectangular frame were filled with generally cosmographical imagery. The four continents, the four elements, the seven planets, the four seasons, celestial hemispheres, and maps of the moon and the sun. On Jan Blau's 1662 map, which is on display as well, from the first volume of the Atlas Mayor, we see the four seasons across the bottom and the seven planets across the top. Note that this version of the map, reproduced by Shirley, included the line of the ecliptic, uh, which is lacking on the Ocean Map Library's two copies. In the 18th century, English and some French geographers replaced the allegories with actual astronomical diagrams. But even as the steadily shifting aesthetics of the 18th century steadily eliminated the overtly decorative elements on world maps, the continued importance of globe study meant that the use of the stereographic projection for world maps, together with the line of the ecliptic, still positioned the Earth within the cosmos. There were, of course, other ways to understand the globe in the early modern era, other than just as an integral component of the geocentric cosmos. The principal alternative was to construe the Earth as a terraqueous globe, as an autonomous sublunar entity. Rare in the, 18, in the 17th century, the overt focus on the terraqueous globe was increasingly expressed over the course of the 18th century. The abandonment after 1650 of the geocentric model of the cosmos was manifested in the removal of the ecliptic from world maps by more philosophically inclined geographers, as Guillaume de Lille did in his world maps of 1700 and 1720. With this subtle act, these geographers made a profound statement about the Earth's displacement from the center of the cosmos, with all the associated moral and metaphysical implications thereof. Although the weight of inertia meant that plenty of more popular works continued to show the ecliptic. A few geographers also reconfigured the hemispheres by preparing oblique aspect projections. By centering one hemisphere in Europe, usually on a capital city, they created a land hemisphere the other formed the ocean hemisphere. Somebody pointed this out earlier. Such maps also lack the ecliptic. In a map that's also on display, Nicolas Antoine Boulanger was explicit in 1753 that such mapping was a means to explore the, uh, the Earth's internal architecture. Some geographers abandoned the stereographic projection altogether for other projections that depict the tracheous globe's continuous surface without interruption. For example, in the 1680s, Jean-Dominique Cassini used the azimuthal equidistant projection to plot newly determined longitudes on the, on the floor of the Paris Observatory. In 1742, Philip Vouache used the same projection to map the global interconnectedness of his supposed chains of mountains. And of course, there was Mercator's projection. Mercator had intended his projection to aid navigation, but it was not readily accepted by practical mariners until 1800 or so. Some geographers used its marine connotations to make nationalistic arguments about burgeoning maritime em empires. They increasingly made world maps that they titled charts on Mercator's projection to show the routes of marine expeditions. This nationalism carried over into the British insistence that Mercator had actually stolen the work of their countryman, Edward Wright, who had worked out the projection's mathematical foundation, although Wright was only like eight years old when Mercator did his map. Ornate cartouches, such as this one showing the four continents, might be used to overcome the lack of spandrels to accommodate allegory. And no world maps on Mercator's projection possessed any indication of the ecliptic. They were all focused on the Earth and its phenomena. Finally, the nascent environmental and social sciences took up Mercator's projection in the 18th century to map the global distribution of social and natural phenomena. For example, in about 1700, Eben Halley mapped the lines of constant magnetic variation in the Atlantic Basin and then around the Indian Ocean as well, 
later natural philosophers followed suit. For example, Didier Robert de Burgundy mapped human physiognomy, skin color, and religion on the same face world map in 1761. The concept of the trachyrus globe was widely accepted by the end of the 18th century. The matched pairs of globes and their associated instructional manuals were discarded by new pedagogies and were increasingly replaced by lonely terrestrial globes. Set at a fixed inclination on a single pedestal without the horizon ring and only a partial meridian ring, these new globes could no longer be used as mathematical instruments. Cosmographical interconnectivities were all dissolved. The trachyrus globe was now positioned at the center of scientific investigation. The triumph of the trachyrus world view did not put an end to the use of double hemisphere world maps. Rather, the form was recast. When he prepared a new world map in 1794, Aaron Arrowsmith felt obliged to adhere to the long established convention and so mapped the world in east and west hemispheres, the old and the new, as and shown in the equatorial aspect. But he replaced the stereographic projection with what he called a globular projection. This was not conformal, so the meridians and parallels do not intersect at right angles. But Arismith argued that it provided a better representation of the globe of the Earth because it produced much less distortion around the limb of each hemisphere. The globular projection was soon universally adopted as geographers created new maps de novo to capture a new onslaught of geographical data from Western imperial expansion. Nor was the ecliptic reinserted into these new world maps. Furthermore, the spandrels of a double hemisphere map still offered wonderful graphic possibilities that could not be passed up. By the 1830s, they were filling up with a ranked arrays of mountains and rivers in either hemisphere that emblematized a systematic empirical study of the natural world that had been popularized by Alexander von Humboldt. Ethnographic imagery also could be included, especially as imperially minded classifications of distinct races were promulgated. The result was a complete focus on the terraqueous globe and its physical and social constitution, and a variant of this map is also on display. Mercator's projection continued to be used to show global distributions of physical and social phenomena, especially under the influence of Heinrich Berghaus and his crucially important Physikalische Atlas of the 1840s. This example from the parallel physical atlas by Johnston included Humboldtian style diagrams of the distribution of plants and mountain chains. But the projection really came into its own under the impetus of imperial and geopolitical change, becoming the projection of choice for mapping the world of global marine empires. The results at the end of the century, especially with respect to the British Empire in conjunction with the Victorious Jubilee, are now well known. We've already seen this map today. But are really only highly decorative instances of a long-standing tradition. The two projections, with their distinct connotations, the maritime geopolitics of the Mercator and the physical character of the globular Earth coexisted throughout the 19th century. General atlases contained both kinds of world map. I've seen this practice as early as about 1780 in Antonio Zata's Atlante Novissimo, and it extends into the 20th century. A precise history of this practice is yet to be written, especially in terms of the respective symbolic refinement and ultimate collapse of the two map forms into one. The coherent, comprehensive, and singular globalized worldview of the early 20th century would not last long, however, and it was certainly challenged by geopolitical shifts around World War II. The repositioning of the Earth as a terraqueous globe, unique unto itself, did not completely do away with the older cosmographical understandings. In particular, the cosmographical division of the Earth into the five Aristotelian zones resurface in the climatic determinism that sustained imperialistic sentiments. As exemplified in his remarkable 1887 map by Levi Yagi, the five zones were used to define not only the distribution of flora and fauna, but also to demarcate global regions appropriate for the settlement of peoples of European stock. Under Lamarckian conceptions of evolution, 
the torrid zone was interpreted as a region of danger to Europeans, where the incessant heat and enervating humidity would make them go native. Only the northern and southern temperate zones were suitable for the white race. Overall, the Enlightenment appears as a period of transition between the peak cosmography of the 17th century and the 19th century triumph of the terraqueous globe. Long supposed to have been an era in which science replaced art in mapping, the Enlightenment is actually revealed as a period when, in addition to many other continuing factors, the dominant worldview transitioned from one global imaginary to another. Thank you. Uh, we will conclude with Lucas Schultz at Stanford University, although uh, he will be uh, moving on to University of Manchester, as I understand. Uh, and he will be talking about uh, mapping airspace. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak here today. And uh, 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 I'll join the other speakers in thanking you for putting together this amazing uh, conference. Uh, most of the cartographic language that we have engaged with over the last few days um, emphasizes the horizontal. It is centered on the crust of the earth as the uh, foil of the cartographer's uh, cultural, political, economic, and natural imagination. Um, and this is in line with a dominating trend um, of historians nowadays who are um, continuously expanding the spatial scope of their studies in a horizontal movement, um, the emblematic example of which is, is perhaps global history. Uh, now, in recent decades, a growing body of literature has begun to discuss the human exploration um, of the atmosphere and outer space in a, a distinctly vertical dynamic. And in this talk, I would also like to adopt a vertical perspective and examine how cartographers engaged with the um, gaseous sea that envelops the globe. Now, the time between 1500 and 1900 saw a number of important changes in how um, early modern contemporaries imagined the space above them, um, from the decline of Aristotelian meteorology um, to the first manned balloon flights. Uh, I would like to explore whether and how these developments found an expression in the cartographic imagination of their time. Um, this is a new project, so um, I, will, I will not attempt to um, develop a comprehensive narrative or a linear narrative um, about the atmosphere's cartographic representation um, with a fairly limited number of examples. Instead, what I'd like to do is highlight several of the key themes um, that pervade the history of atmospheric cartography um, between 1500 and 1900. Um, um, in all those cases, as you will see, the atmosphere plays a role as a medium of horizontal and vertical connection. Um, now, to begin, uh, I think one example is, uh, some of the early earliest examples are um, of um, 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 cartographers who were uh, particularly concerned with the atmospheric um, circulation. Um, because um, uh, maritime surface winds powered what um, Greg Bankoff called Europe's Aeolian empires. Now, one of the earliest examples is uh, the cosmographic map uh, by the German uh, humanist uh, Peter Apianus from uh, 1544. It's a fairly common format. It's a heart-shaped projection of the Earth's surface that is surrounded by um, 12 wind deities um, divided according to the Aristotelian uh, schema. And it allowed to represent, uh, and we've seen sub many other examples of this on, on maps that actually have been shown today uh, and yesterday. And, and they allowed to represent uh, both the names of important winds and the cardinal directions. Um, the image of uh, wind blowing uh, from a mouth um, um, also um, fit in with the, with the, with the uh, common notion at the time that wind originated from closed chambers. Now, in the course of the um, 17th and the 18th centuries, winds were less and less frequently represented in uh, personified forms. Um, and some scholars, um, um, some art historians have taken that as a, as, a, as a token for the decreasing importance of mythologic knowledge. In the 18th century, um, ocean wind maps become um, the perhaps the most common context in which the atmospheric circulation uh, rep was represented on maps. 
Um, what you see here is a um, 1793 version of um, a map by uh, Rigobert Bon. Uh, it's called uh, the map of the direction of the general winds and monsoons. Um, as you see, the surface winds are represented in two dimensions. Um, they're limited to the surface of the sea, where they were relevant for navigation, um, and the land surface do not have an atmospheric layer. Now, the wind, the wind directions are indicated through arrows and hatchings, uh, which assigns them an important place in the visual hierarchy um, um, of the map. Um, now, this method of symbolization goes back to the earliest wind map, which is Edmunds Halley's map of the trade winds from uh, 1686. Um, the, the language that Halley chose, um, uh, where he represented maritime surface winds through dash uh, pointed lines, was adopted by later cartographers. And it actually remains the preferred method of symbolization in, um, in interactive um, digital wind maps uh, even nowadays. Now, some scholars of early modern meteorology have argued um, that the 18th century saw a, a gradual normalization of meteorological phenomena, with observers increasingly focusing um, on the regular and the global instead of the local and the exceptional. Now, I think the wind map can be seen as an early example for the simultaneous shift to the global dimension of surface winds and on their regular recurrence. However, an important difference between early and late modern understandings of the atmosphere is the early modern assumptions that events underneath on and above um, the surface of the Earth were closely connected. Now, a good illustration of that is a map, and you can, always, you can also see it in the case over there, um, titled A Recent Description of the Terrestrial Globe, um, which is an engraving showing a cross-section of the Earth and the atmosphere that has been created in Zurich in the 1690s by a physician and a local publisher, on which, unfortunately, we don't have much information. Uh, the map is dedicated to the states of Holland and West Frisia, um, uh, which is, was the government of the leading province of the Dutch Republic, the county of Holland. Um, and it, it references um, uh, the imagery um, from Antanasius Kircher's uh, Mundus Subterraneus, which was published a couple of decades earlier. Now, it, it's a remarkable specimen in several respects, but the reason why it caught my attention is that um, the space above the crust of the Earth depicts a variety of atmospheric phenomena and their interaction with the sea and with the forces in the uh, interior of the Earth. As you see, the clouds delimit the visible phenomena beyond which one can only see um, the sun and the moon. Now, this engraving is particularly interesting because it is one of the earliest maps to represent the air as a distinct spatial feature marked with le the letter R um, on the map. Um, the map legend describes the air as composed of small dendritic particles, um, which is probably an early reflection of Cartesian meteorology and a, a turn to a corpuscular paradigm that sought to explain the structure of nature on the exclusive basis of, hypothet of a hypothetical morphology of particles and their combination. And it is actually quite possible that this rendition of the air was inspired by the illustrations in um, Descartes' uh, Meteor, which has been dubbed an elegy of seeing and set new standards for the visual representation of weather phenomena. The map is also a good illustration of um, um, the classical and the early modern meteorologist fixation with motion and disorder. Um, the, the sublunary sphere was a space was was perceived as a space of disorder, as opposed to the the calmness of the ethereal spheres. Um, and what we find on the map is a highly a highly dynamic representations of of storms, of wind, of rain, um, of smoke, of erupting volcanoes, um, and of streams of inflammable matter that emanates from the center of the Earth. Um, complemented by a legend that emphasizes that everything we see is in motion. Now, the, the map legend explains that all the phenomena we see, rain, uh, wind, tornadoes, um, earthquakes, and volcanoes, um, are animated by interactions between subtle and inflammable matter. Um, uh, uh, now, this is related to the Aristotel Aristotelian notion of exhalations, uh, according to which the space between the crust of the Earth and the, lunar is the sublunary sphere, oh sorry, the lunar sphere um, was filled with two types of exhalations, a uh, vaporous moist exhalation, uh, cold exhalation from water, um, 
and a, and a, a smoky, hot, and dry exhalation that came from the Earth, from the Earth itself. And their varying mixtures are essentially the material source of all meteorological phenomena and the, 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 the logical principle that unites them. Now, according to the map legend, the origin of these movements is the subtle heavenly matter at the center of the Earth, which moves, I, and I'm quoting, the, I'm quoting the legend, which moves very fast and because of which everything within and outside the Earth is moved. Now, wherever this materia uh, celestis comes into contact with the subterranean flammable matter, it begins to burn and erupts in volcanoes. And indeed, visually and conceptually, um, the volcanoes, in this case um, um, the Etna and, and Sicily, are one of the most salient elements of vertical connection between the subterranean and the sublunary spheres. Um, the erupting arteries of flammable matter are also, and you can see them marked with, um, with, with five, if you can make it out on the, on the map, um, are also the cause of wind, of rain, of storms, because they let the water evaporate into the atmosphere. Now, this brings me to uh, the fourth and last map uh, that I want to talk about, which um, where all these connections between the subterranean and the atmospheric worlds disappear, except for the volcanoes. Um, it is a map from 1851. Um, it comes from a celestial atlas that was edited by a high school teacher in the German city of Augsburg. Um, the man also operated the local observatory. Um, and it, it shows a cross-section of the Earth surrounded by an atmospheric halo that reflects the decreasing density of air and a quite fluid boundary between the atmosphere and outer space. Um, there's a noticeable contract from, previous, from the previous cost section in the sense that it avoided the problem, which, which avoided this problem by limiting our range of vision with a clouded sky. Now, the map is concerned with the problem of atmospheric refraction. Um, it basically illustrates how the variation of air density deviates light waves from a straight line as they pass through the atmosphere, um, making the sun appear higher um, than it actually is. Um, so in this, in this depiction, the atmosphere operates as a conduit of light between outer space and the terrestrial surface. And one can perhaps see this as an example for the intertwining of um, geography and astronomy in mathematical cosmography. Um, and the map also illustrates the close historical connections between optics and meteorology. Um, there's, there's a complex relationship between sight and atmospheric events that I think deserves further study. But um, for now, let me quote um, the climatologist Percy Crowe, who once um, argued that scholars who study the atmosphere are concerned with events near the base of a mobile medium um, that um, those scholars are shown upon, they are rained upon, they are buffeted around by the influences emanating from above. And that makes that their observations are more concerned uh, with effects rather than with causes. Now, I think that both these cross-sections show um, um, that, um, um, that th both these cross-sections were deeply concerned with visualizing um, causality rather than just um, effects. Um, so let me, let me conclude. Um, whether they show the atmosphere as wind deities, um, as wind patterns, as aerial particles, um, as a halo of variable density, the maps that we have seen uh, show different ways in which cartographers imagined the atmosphere in its horizontal and vertical um, dimensions. And some of the early modern ways of understanding the atmosphere uh, may mystify contemporary observers. But I hope I could show that it is worthwhile to reflect more systematically on our visual imagination of the atmosphere. Um, even though, or precisely because, the current intellectual moment pushes us to think in terms of horizontal movements and connections. And perhaps cartographically, the atmosphere has never been more present than today. Look at the moving map in front of you, uh, in front of your, of your seat on your flight back home, or at the weather maps that Martin Lewis evoked yesterday. Um, I think those maps remind us that we are dwelling in gas and that our history unfolds in more than just a horizontal plane. And in fact, the atmosphere remains at the heart of some um, of, the, of, um, of, of more recent debates as a key arena of late modern globalization and global warming. And I think that the, the visual apparatus with, with, with which map makers have tried to represent and make sense of what goes on above our heads um, has, a, has a long history that is worth exploring. Thank you. Thank you.
have plenty of time for questions. Thank you both so much. This has been so much fun. And I hope we can go on with questions for quite a while. Um, I love it also that we have come full circle from the weather maps with which we started to the meteorology at the end. But um, and apologies to everybody for the fussing around with the screen during the last 20 minutes. This was my request to bring up um, one of these maps from the first talk, Matthew's talk, because Given where it's hanging on the wall, what was at my eye level was these very interesting images, these anthropomorphized images of the seasons. And I couldn't help but be struck by the fact that all four of them are being pulled by carts that are drawn by birds. I have never seen that in European art, and I thought in some way, interesting way, it maybe joins the topics of both of your papers. If there is some kind of iconographic gesture toward the fact that it's the winds that are moving, some kind of airborne force that's moving the seasons. And I wondered if anybody in the room, maybe Corin with your mythological background, <laughs> or Sumati with your big visual um, archive, if anybody, including those of you who were speakers, has some ideas about that quite striking imagery. <coughs> to be honest, I've not actually thought in those terms, uh, because the each of the birds and the animals all tie into the seasons. So when you get to um, Bacchus enjoying his wine and the grapes, uh, he's being pulled along by some fairly adult uh, rams, and you've got some partridges or something, which are a, a fall hunting bird, or a, a bird that is hunted in the fall. Um, as opposed to the baby animals who are pulling spring at the far left. And so I've always thought those the birds there are sort of birds associated with the spring. So, um, and the owls and the old man winter because it's dark and owls see in the dark and all those connotations. Um, so I'm not completely sure that, that you can make that extension. <laughs> I don't have an answer to that question, but I have another question. Can I, somebody sure. else wants to go with that? Because otherwise, okay. I thank you both. This was, it was just uh, brilliant to hear both these. Uh, it was just brilliant to hear both these presentations. And maybe you gentlemen can solve something that has puzzled me ever since I read Mary Turrell's wonderful book, The Man Who Flattened the Poles. Right, and the Earth is really not a perfect sphere, but globes continue to be shown as perfect. All the maps that you've shown, except the last one where you had a little bit of a, the sphere is a little less of a perfect sphere. So how do we want to account, like this one, right? The sphere is not a perfect sphere. It's got all these emendations. It's still not flattened at the poles. So how do we want to account for this hegemony of the sphere, this perfect sphere? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you've got there is another hour-long lecture, at least. Um, <laughs> I'm going to let Lake deal with these diagrams because um, they really get into the elements of this stuff. But in terms of globes, um, in the 18th century, when, when, when people were figuring out that um, the world is not perfectly spherical, um, there were some people like Rigobert Bon who said, we should, make, we should take this into account in our maps and our globes. And there are others like Robert Didier Robert de Vogandy who said, well, that's just stupid. I mean, you're looking at two millimeters of difference on a regular map, which is less than the average shrinkage or expansion of paper. So by taking that into account, you're just adding a layer of complexity that's utterly irrelevant. And you have a few people who try to do the same thing with globes, but the Earth's flattening is so slight that you have to make a really big globe for it to, to have an appreciable difference between your polar and your equatorial axis. And it's so big, and you're standing so far away from it, you don't see it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see the flattening. So, but having said that, 
even when you look at you know 17th century people um, writing about spherical Earth, whether it's Picard or Riccioli or whoever, they all say this is a fiction. This is water level. It's um, an average that we we assume a, 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 a perfect shape, even though we know that the Earth is utterly corrugated and bumpy. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think I'm enough an, of an expert to, to answer this question. But I think one thing that struck me yesterday, and I don't remember who showed that map, but there was a map that was the globe devoid of water, and it was this unshapely, weird, <laughs> yeah. And that was an amazing, I think, and, and what struck me in that map, and that perhaps a, is a potential for, for the kind of um, the kind of interactive maps that, right, like Google Earth, that you can play with and remove layers that, that we can do nowadays to perhaps further a little, m uh, a somewhat more complex and, 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 and um, an image of the Earth that isn't, right, that isn't the perfect, the perfect sphere and, and, the, and the perfect globe. And actually, just because you mentioned the word, the technical, in case you don't know this, the technical name for the Earth shape today is a geoid, which means Earth-shaped. <laughs> <laughs> it is unique. I it was an oblate spheroid. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not even a, it's not even a smooth ellipsoidal rotation. It's far more complex. <laughs> Thank you. Um, fascinating arc. <laughs> that and, and well done um, to all of you who imagined this and who presented this for us. Uh, a question that, uh, Serge, I think where you brought us is really to the challenges of how do we really start to imagine how to represent the new visions of um, the world, the earth, the planet, this cosmos that we're inhabiting. Because we really are in, I think, in a time where we really do need to have new ways of understanding and representing it. A and just two, <laughs> so this is maybe where you're going, why you brought us together. Um, and, and two things in particular come to my mind that are uh, puzzling. How do we start to really represent? And one is this concept of the critical zone um, that is being you know, worked on. We have critical zone observatories, tiny, tiny in terms of the overall scale of know the planet but critical for life forms for for human um, you know uh, existence really uh, in life and then the other and the um, the other broad concept is um, representations of and mapping of the Anthropocene of this time that we many of us feel we're living in so making that transition I mean it's a whole other conference but uh, <laughs> maybe you've taken us to the edge of it. So, so perhaps I can speak to, the, to, your, to your second question, which I think is, is fascinating. And in a way, I would have wished I could have um, pushed this further into the 20th and the 21st century, because then we get, um, we get maps that, are, um, that I find really fascinating. Um, 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 so for instance, wind, wind maps that you get nowadays. But also, um, I, I read an article recently that looked at how the globe is being how the globe is being used in the environmental discourse and has become has has become a symbol in 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 the context on, of environmentalism, which is a which is which is connected to the to the to the to, to growing, growing conscience about global warming, right? And and the and the Anthropocene. So I think there is definitely there's certainly something there. Um, and, uh, that actually brings up a really interesting point. There was a fun study several years ago uh, of the use of maps in political rhetoric in this country that demonstrated you know, 95%, well, even more, 100% of the maps in Republican discourse, you know, in, in label you know, badges for presidential candidates and so on, all of those maps are the 48 states, maybe with Alaska, sometimes with the Hawaii, but at least the 48 contiguous states, whereas all the map imagery used by Democrat politicians, Democratic politicians, was a globe. Not <coughs> and this is before the mo mo more recent uh, upsurge in, in climate change concerns, but it's definitely in terms of trying to, trying to argue a, a, a politics of that's globally aware. So, and the globe imagery is definitely proliferating in that sense. <coughs> 
Yeah, um, can you hear? Uh, I've got 2% information on this, so it's enough to be dangerous, but I know during, during the 70s, in terms of studying the surface irregularities in the surface of the, the Earth's crust, uh, there was a, a proposed theory that the net mass of the Pacific offset the mat net mass of the, the highest relief on the planet, which is the Tibetan Plateau, that those two masses compensated each other and affected Earth wobble. That was an idea that was further discredited, but it led to the discovery of the equatorial mega shear, which is uh, the, the northern hemisphere land mass as it evolved from Gondwana land when the concentration of the, uh, the above surface continental masses of the Earth were more concentrated in the southern hemisphere, and now they're in the northern hemisphere. And that over the last 350 million years, the crust, the, the rotation gradient difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere has been discovered because of the one of the original fantasies, which was that the Pacific Ocean and the Tibetan Plateau offset each other. So it kind of connects back to the idea of where imagination comes to influence more accurate readings of what, what we are as a species and what the, what the planet is. That's geology. I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for two wonderful papers. Um, I wanted to go back briefly to what we were uh, talking about yesterday, which is the different forms and conventions that govern these ways of representing um, phenomena that, that are sometimes visual and sometimes are not. And I wondered, especially in this representation of, of wind, um, whether there you find, having looked at, at lots of different ones, whether you think there um, they it is easier to let go of these conventions or whether here um, there is actually some kind of creativity that is innovative. We were talking yesterday um, in the in at the reception with, with Ali, I think uh, she's not here anymore, right? She was saying that actually it's not possible to come up with new images mm. because everything that you imagined, imagine is shaped by memory, right? Which is a kind of neuroscience way of, of representing it. And it seems to me that that goes against the kind of creativity that is at work w in representations of the wind. I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think in a way there is continuity in the sense that at least the winds map, wind maps that I've seen, um, they all use this language developed by Halley, which are these pointed dashed, um, dashed lines. I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions, but um, so I find it striking to find the same kind of visualization in on, 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 on this and on other um, wind maps that you can find across the, across the internet. Um, but I think what's perhaps the element of innovation here in this case is the I would say is more is is is, is the colors right and the um, and the and the and the and the and the and the movement of the map which make them I think also an aesthetic at least I really like like them just from from an aesthetical point of view um, and uh, perhaps perhaps this can be yeah perhaps you could argue here that there is a technological that in this case when we talked about um, uh, technological advances, right, and how and whether and how these these allow for for, for for new creation. Perhaps this is an example of how, right, there is a new you have some kind of innovation at that at that level. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for two great papers. Um, I have a question for Luca. I'm very fascinated all these sort of air and and wind um, and a lot of the maps that we've been looking at over these two days um, you know they talk a lot about ownership and I'm just curious if in any of this you come across a is there any assertion of ownership of this airspace um, I'm recently having moved back to Northern California it struck me I know in San Francisco you can own the airspace over someone else's house to preserve your view in the area um, so I'm curious, you know, thinking about ownership of land, are you seeing any of this carrying over to ownership of the atmosphere? Uh, that, thanks. Um, so not in, the, not in the 17th century, not in the 18th century. Um, what you find, though, in the, in the, in the 20th century is, is, and I'm sure you have seen these maps, which are basically, which, which show how, the basically the legal regime of airspace that governs, um, that governs commercial flight traffic and, and basically specifies who is allowed to fly a drone up to which height, right, where you can, um, 
paraglide and, and, and where w which areas are, are preserved for. And that is a fascinating, so I don't have any of those maps here, but that's a fascinating genre um, in itself, I think. Um, now the notion, but I think the notion of property of airspace, which we also tend to um, tend to write, that is that is it's basically some it's, it's a legal history that starts with the turn at the turn of the 20th century, right, with 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 the rise of commercial um, of, of heavier than air um, um, aviation. Well, actually, I found examples in from the early modern period, from from the Holy Roman Empire, treatises on air law um, at the at the time. They don't use any cartographic devices for it, but the notion that the air is something that can be owned. Um, is actually much older than, than one would think. So the earliest is from 1655, I think, and then they go all through the 17th century. Yes, thank you both for these talks. Um, I think my question would apply to both because I'm really interested in the way that math uh, sort of relates to these visual representations. And so like for this image here, you know, I'd always assume that with these weather maps that they're depicted this way uh, because of the, the calculus or whatever that goes into it, like the vector fields that they're used to model this sort of thing. But then of course, Lucas showed that earlier map which shows that it's really a continuation of like uh, existing sort of visual codes in a sense. Uh, and so I guess my question is really, um, you know, are, are people using or new developments in math really use just to, um, I guess, make sense of existing styles of visual rep representation? Or is it more that math is helping us or forcing us to consider new ways of visualizing the earth? Or is it really a chicken and egg thing where it's just they fold into each other? <laughs> this is going way off topic from my paper, uh, but right into the class I'm teaching right now. Um, you know, digi digital designers like to talk about affordances. You know, what 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 does the technology afford the user that goes beyond whatever was actually intended for the technology to do? Um, and I think that there are the the way the graphic design, or at least cartographic, analytical mapping design has gone, has been into recognizing the affordances of different kinds of cartographic symbols. So the line is something that is, for Halley, is it's for the winds, is an automatic concept in the sense of this is the, tr this is the path that the, w that the, the winds track <laughs> in the same way that you can, you can prick the chart and keep the track of your, of your route on, on the ship. Um, and then issues of um, Jacques Bertin's visual variables, where he's talking about the different kinds of variables that you can apply to, well, the native people then start applying different kinds of data. So um, speed for, 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 for moving stuff, you know, speed, uh, the width of the line, the color of the line, all suitable for representing good ratio data. So you can, you can see in this, I mean, they're, they're using multiple symbolic visual variables to map really just one dimension. Well, three dimensions, you've got location and then the, the speed of the wind. Um, but they're doing it in a way that, that makes it very evocative. So there's some sort of, there's, there's an artistry in here beyond the, the, the basic math. Um, so what I see in, in how people are doing this kind of work, uh, which I don't do, but um, I know a few people who do, but not very well, uh, <laughs> it's more a sense of, of trying to take these, these now codified visual variables and try to apply them to the results of whatever data modeling you, you're, you're looking at. Um, so now it's a question of how you, how you combine those visual variables. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Global. Um, so, so the the, the nation uh, isn't isn't really hasn't really been very visible. I was just thinking that uh, I sort of remember for when, when I was younger that the weather map was always national. <laughs> 
um, sometimes quite weirdly. And so these wings would come out of nowhere, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's particularly uh, funny wh when you look at Spain where Portugal is missing on, on Spanish national TV <laughs> and you wonder where, you know, is the Atlantic there? Is, is, is there another country? Um, more recently, it seems to me that there has been a little bit of a shift. So for example, now you get the map of the jet stream uh, in English newspapers. Um, and that's that does create a sort of a wider image of, of, for example, the British Isles being part of the North Atlantic system with, you know, going from Canada to Siberia. Uh, all of that is on the map suddenly. So, so I wonder if, if there is something going on there visually that you have looked at or that you might look at that tells a story. Uh, not necessarily an, a linear story because as, yeah. as Matthew just said, um, it, it could there could be politics to this and it might play out differently in different quarters of, of society. Um, so there might be a, ma a manipulation of this. Um, um, and I, I think it's particularly sort of disturbing how on the one hand, the image that you have you just, just there on the screen um, obviously deconstructs the nation state or undermines it. Hmm. But it could also be used to to um, to raise fears. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. if you use th this kind of visual imagery to represent migration, um, and then the nation mm -hmm. could suddenly become very strong again as, as a stronghold against movement. So I'm just wondering whether you think it's worth looking into these things. Yeah, definitely. I think that sounds like, and actually I didn't think about that, but now that you say it, it makes, it, it does make perfect sense and it would actually be interesting to look, to look a little further, right, into the, uh, also in, 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 in into this kind of um, meteorological um, visuals. I think one thing that comes to mind, an example that comes to mind is I think that when in 1986, when Chernobyl happened and everyone was concerned about how, about the wind patterns that would transport the particles uh, across Europe, um, the French maps didn't didn't show any. Uh, basically, the cloud stopped at the at the at the French German border. Um, <laughs> there, there didn't. So I think there could be, and I, I think so. I think that could be one example, right, of how how these kinds of how there's also politics involved in these kinds of visualizations. And at the same time, and perhaps that's also what makes these maps so alluring nowadays, at least for people who, who who like to travel and and and, and are open to th through the world is, is precisely this global dimension that they have what is there more global than the atmosphere um, and if you I really like those if you, if you go on a it's a website called windy.com if you just want to spend a couple of minutes just looking at these amazing visuals that is I think that is a good example um, we're going to move into a general discussion for a while I have one question though that I can't resist. Uh, for Matthew, having to do with those striking images from, is it Yagi? Yagi? Yagi. Yagi. Uh, which really struck me that these ancient Greek idea of the five klima are still present. It brings to my mind what I sometimes tell my students is a recalcitrant nonsense. Uh, the prime idea I like to use is uh, the notion that most educated Europeans thought the world was flat. Uh, I polled my students in the world history class just, what, a week ago, and I think two-thirds of them were taught that. One argued against her teacher and got in trouble for having the temerity to do so. <laughs> but I'm just astounded that uh, so long after Humboldt, we still have the idea, uh, I mean, well, we don't have any notion of east versus west sides of continents, of, of uh, oceanic currents. I mean, Lima, Peru is supposedly uh, you know, a hot uh, play, or elevation. I mean, this is right, well, at this time, Europeans were moving into the high plateaus of Colombia in pretty large numbers. Soon they're going to be doing so in Kenya and uh, what is now Zimbabwe. Uh, was he aw aware of this or just was just simplifying grotesquely because underestimating the, in well, maybe not underestimating, but uh, viewing the intelligence at a pretty low level? <laughs> well, I think you put your finger on the issue when you refer to being in a classroom and what is two thirds of your students were taught that <coughs> medieval thinkers thought the world was flat, uh, which recently, by the way, was resurfaced in a um, peer-reviewed article, like <laughs> 12 months ago, uh, which I still can't believe. Um, because Yagi's geographical grammar uh, was a, a didactic tool. It was part of a larger set of maps that are all quite different. Um, and it's part of a classroom set. And so when you look at the, um, the geography textbooks created, especially in this country, around um, 
I mean, for, for, for grade schoolers, those classic sort of Cornell's geographical primer, the stuff you find in second-hand bookstores all over, um, they are really simplifying things. They don't, they don't really care what's going on in the high science. Um, they're arguing around various political uh, ideologies, racial ideologies. Um, and so for them, it ties into the non-natural historical discourses of imperialism, of the white man's burden, of how, how does Europeans, how do Europeans live in the tropics without all these Lamarckian concepts of, adap of adaptation and going native, um, which you see, I mean, it's in literature all the way through the 20th century and film and uh, all sorts of things. So it's very much a, a, a public, politicized, idealized discourse that's quite separate from what the actual scientists are doing um, and is very much simplified for, for K through 12. from the last day and a half. Any comments or questions are quite welcome. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, accept our appreciation. <laughs> yeah, on that, uh, relating to Zoltan's uh, question about the politicization of these, uh, the, the global, the uh, environmental uh, movement around dealing with global warming is looking for this kind of imagery to promote understanding of us as a species rather than as a nationalistic subgroups. And uh, so part of the uh, question, uh, well, anyway, separate from that, leading to the question of accuracy on this kind of imagery, uh, understanding that this image is, that you know, the, the jet stream is what, 50,000 feet above the surface, which is, you know, what's that, 10 miles? 10 miles horizontally, talking about verticality and horizontality. This image is uh, an image of a set of membranes that are, you know, uh, 10 miles on the horizontal scale on that. If you flip that over and look at it as a vertical, these these surface, these these meteorological phenomena are paper thin, beyond, not even not even that. They are minuscule. You know, if you if you just imagine what 10 miles is on the horizontal scale, there it doesn't give you the size of an ant across the bottom of Florida there. So we live in that thinness. Thank you, yes, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> this isn't entirely general, but to Matthew, um, I, you mentioned the Vaughany Atlas and how it started to map people by religion and color. I've looked at that those atlases some and I, a little like beginner question. You, you, how unique is that? I mean, this mid 18th century map of, of mapping people like that, and by the way, immobile. Um, yeah. Is, is it, yeah, to what extent is it in the, when Vogandy were working, is it unique? I think it is fairly unique. Um, you have people mapping language distribution um, going back into the late 17th century um, where language is sort of standing for culture to some degree. Um, but in the middle of the 18th century, there is a concern for how do we explain different skin colors? And so there are a number of prize essays offered, um, prizes offered for the best essay on the origin of skin color by Academy de Science, and there's one in Nice, I think, Academy of Nice that offered one. And so people are trying to explain without any sense of modern genetics, um, let alone modern biology, um, how color evolves. Why, why some people are quite white, some are black, or some are something else. Um, so when Roberta Vogandy is 
um, mapping these things. It's very much part of a moment um, where people have been talking about this and um, there's enough data by the mid-18th century that you can go through the narratives and the travels and um, certainly you can certainly map out religion. Um, I mean, you've got, I mean, the one thing that's missing from that great multi-volume Amsterdam publication of, of the nature of religion that Margaret Jacob loves so much and thinks is the origin of the Enlightenment, um, which it may be. Uh, <laughs> she just pushes it a bit too strongly. Um, that, that, that book, which is supposedly all about, you know, this, this, this utterly rational comparison of, of religion without saying, well, of course, Protestant Christianity is better than Catholicism, or that Catholicism is better than Judaism. They're trying to be sort of also factual and focus on rituals and so on. What's missing in that book is a map, even though they've got a fair amount of stuff, knowledge. Um, so by the mid-18th century, when they are starting to map social phenomena, at a point when they they're getting more information from in public circles, public discourse for um, from explorations and imperial activity, then Robert de Vogendy is sort of taking a few thoughts and putting them together. I, w I want to go back to the the big question and something I'm struggling with when. We all fill the what is a global imaginary when you do a call for paper with how do I connect through my research to the bigger question of what is a global imaginary. And perhaps something I've heard over the last two days is there are those of us who are trying to map people in a global space or think about humans on the earth. And there are other projects that are really thinking about how does our understanding of the globe um, change as we're doing that. And so I'm just wondering what other kind of big transversals, because those seem to be two very different sets of questions. How do people connect on on the Earth versus what do we understand about the Earth itself, the planet, the globe, all those very carefully done words. So uh, that's, that's just the question that I'm trying to mull right now. Would anybody like to take that up? Well, that's first. Miss Jones. <laughs> Why not? We're angels here to tread. <laughs> um, yes, uh, my name's Sandy Nichols, uh, geographer, um, cultural geographer primarily, but working on Humboldt and the Anthropocene and various other <laughs> aspects. My my first reaction, overly simplistic for sure, is but that's what we're struggling with. I think right now in this moment is actually. You, you can keep them separate, the phys you know, and we have the balkanization in the geography departments between the physical and the cultural and the economic and so forth. And you know, when were they? St when w was there ever a point when there was an attempt to have a much more integrative, which is what took me back to Humboldt. Um, and then we have a whole, you know, splintering balkanization, specialization, you know, Dharma and, and everything else. So uh, I think it's still worth struggling for that integration, but we make advances on both both ways is my response. Um, completely different question, but um, maybe to Luca or to Matthew or Luca, um, is there a modern atlas that is um, that makes you feel like it's covering everything you would want to know or that uh, uh, expresses accuracy, expresses, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, but uh, is there a modern atlas that, that, that you folks like? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um, I don't really look at modern atlases <laughs> very often, <laughs> uh, being an historian. Um, so no, I mean, <laughs> I mean, there are some really cool historical atlases which I really, really love. Um, historical atlas of Canada, that of New Zealand, the recent one of Maine, and a couple of others which are really trying to deal with indigenous peoples of those places, bring giving them a voice, trying to actually understand the nature of 
social variance, cultural variance within these countries and states. Um, but in terms of contemporary world mapping, I don't know. Google. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll add, there's a fantastic historical atlas of Tibet. Is uh, Carl Vryavec still here? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I would I would suggest you take a look at Carl's uh, the historical atlas of Tibet if you love historical atlases, but probably most of you do. <laughs> uh, so actually, yeah. Also, I I, I wouldn't know about. Uh, all comprehensive master atlas for the contemporary age, but I definitely think that um, one thing to, to look at, which is quite exciting, is Google um, is is what go comes out of Google, and they they have they have a thing. I think it's called Google Earth Engine, um, which has th there's several things that there's a lot of things that you can do with it. But one thing that they have they have basically a viewer where you can where they have their satellite imagery of the last 15 or 20 years, and you can you can basically play a film with it, and you can zoom in on a place on cities and. If, if there was a lot of um, construction going on, you can actually retrace that. So I think that is absolutely stunning. Um, and then in terms of historical atlases, there is a lot that, that, that's being done. But I think one that I like in particular is called American Panorama. Um, and it has it's, it's a set of historical maps that, that address different questions in American history. But it's, uh, I think it's really well named. Other uh, comments or questions? Yes, Quintana. I just want to run with this idea of, of Google a little bit, not so much a question, um, but uh, you know this idea of accuracy and Google. And I think Ademide brought up about Lagos, how if you use Google, it would not help you at all um, when trying to find your way around. I've certain ha certainly had that case uh, too. And, and it seems like on one hand, it's very accurate. On the other hand, um, you know, the maps that we've been looking at have a lot more information because there's text, there's interpretation, um, which Google Earth just sort of throws up on the screen and you're supposed to figure out what to do with it. Um, and some of that information is also very problematic. I know in Japan there was an issue where I guess they started layering um, historical maps on top, but that showed where the historically um, uh, sort of outcast society lived, and then that was problematic because in theory, if you and your family still lived there, maybe you had been part of that group. Um, so it's sort of interesting, you know, looking way forward for us all working in these sort of further back areas, the sort of interesting point with Google Earth and, oh, there's so much accuracy, um, but how sort of more or less interpretation can help or hinder us with that sort of approach to uh, geography and mapping um, when you're just sort of thrown information at you without a lot of hand-holding for it. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, there's, there's some very interesting work being done in the critical GIS arena of um, the gendered construction of our data sets. So, for example, if you, uh, if you use um, the open map, system which is community run and the community is mostly men and so in open maps open atlas whatever it's called you will find locations of brothels and pubs but when a few women said hey can we put in locations of creches the organizing committee was like no <laughs> what's that that's some some weird woman thing we don't want that um, and it took a very long time, like, I think it was like two years of arguing before um, the women in, in, in the community got crashes and daycare centers and stuff added into the data set, or at least permitted to be entered in the data set. And I can go on for other examples. I don't know if, if people have looked at the time lapse here on the side screen, it may be worth, uh, uh, is it not in motion anymore? <laughs> yeah. What's the time period? 84 to 2016. Yeah, 80 1984 to 2016. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't go back earlier than that. Las Vegas had something like 2,000 people. And after World War II. <laughs>
Do we want to have uh, concluding comments? I'd like to ask the organizers if this is what you had in mind. <laughs> this is way better than anything we could imagine. <laughs> Seriously. Um, the, the ways in which the papers dialogue with each other, as well as the ways in which once we got you all in the room, you dialogue with each other and with our students and the librarians and our colleagues. Um, all of that you uh, was well beyond what I had allowed myself to hope for, just speaking for myself. Um, and to go back to the earlier question, I think maybe it was Jordana about some people are looking at the imagination of the globe and others about the ways in which when you bore down in, you see global connections operating at a local scale. As somebody who teaches both a regional history and world history, I've thought of that as different ends of the telescope, but we're we're all looking at global interconnections. That's what the early modern period is all about as far as I'm concerned. That's how I define it. It's the beginning of the global age. And so all of the papers at whatever scale, whether they're looking at an individual city uh, or, look or even a plantation or, or glo look trying to encompass the whole planet somehow in one piece of paper, I think all of them are reckoning in some way visually with these new global connections. And I don't know why I find that so fascinating, but all of you must too, because you're still here. <laughs> um, so that's very exciting for me. I'd have to say there was something very painful about this process, which was turning down a lot of people who wanted to come. Mm -hmm. We were, I was very surprised at how many proposals we had and the number of very promising proposals. We just had to say, I'm sorry, there just <laughs> isn't enough room. <laughs> I mean, we decided not to have a kind of grand conclusion, but I, I, I think I, I totally echo what both of you have just said. I mean, it was a shame to turn people down, and what we had was, was really exciting and a really uh, wonderful set of papers in combination with each other. And the thing that struck me uh, most as I was listening to the, to the variety of the papers was the kind of ways in which... Uh, different um, connections m manifested itself, and they were n not ever contrast, but always in combination. So, for example, the kind of connection between, on the one hand, art, and on the other hand, science. So neither of those are exclusive or contradictory, um, but there was a kind of, on the one hand, you know, our keynote speaker had art and going artfully global, uh, the, the kind of art of mapping that we saw, the way in which maps appear in art, uh, that, that seemed to be a theme, but at the same time that worked very closely with science and the technology of mapping and the ways in which um, accuracy came into it, but also how different technologies created different ways of representing that. So different art appeared on the basis of different technologies. So those two uh, worked together. And then on the other hand, the kind of the the nexus of the or the spectrum of um, the kind of epistemology. So how do we know things, and how do what are the things we don't know, and how do we represent those, and how do they become a kind of thing? The terra incognita, the kind of uh, wavy lines, the ways in which knowledge and and the absence of knowledge are represented. But on the other side, all of the different forms that take. So the kind of um, form and genre, the ways in which fantasies are expressed, the kind of linguistic range, which again works closely together with what do we know and how do we represent what we know. Um, and so those two th things appeared for me very clearly, but then next to that was this very powerful uh, presence of power. I mean, it, you know, power really appeared very, very visibly in, in a number of the papers and that power and the ways in which power is violence uh, was very striking to me. So the, the ways in which creating a map is at the same time also a violent act of not representing things or, or appropriating uh, knowledge and experiences. And 
the the fact that some of it is represented and some of it is written out of the story is extremely painful to realize so i think the violence and and power of that is is for me that was a really striking insight uh, but through all of that for me as somebody who works on material culture was the materiality of it and i think that was you know having all of this happen in this room with these maps right around us both the technology and art of it, the forms of it, the epistemology of it, but seeing the colors and the sizes and the shapes and the, the, the texture of it uh, with the big screen. I mean, I think having the material side so present made this a conference like no other. I think it, having it in a library, which meant we couldn't have coffee, that may have been you know, a <laughs> downside, but the upsides were way out, you know, much more powerful, and I thought, you know, for me, that was all a, a very, very uh, happy experience. And I just, I think one of the things we were meant to do up here is to thank the people who made this possible, right? And I think that's something we want to recognize. The center has been absolutely amazing to make this possible for us. Can I echo my, uh, my colleagues in the sense that um, I think the, the presenters and indeed also the, uh, the, the audience and the public has delivered much more than what we had asked uh, originally. Uh, in many ways it makes our life more difficult because we started with uh, an idea that had a coherence and now it's an idea that is expanding and moving very similar to those, uh, to those currents. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the global imaginary, I have, a, I have an in, uh, a week dedicated, my students have a week imposed on them in my course on globalization, on the global imaginary. I somewhat borrowed that <laughs> because, uh, and I'm very happy that we ended up with the present because um, very much the condition of globalization, you might say, or the uh, end result of a process is considered both in real terms but also in the ways in which it is truly imagined and today also in which the ways in which that imagination is used politically. Um, and that I think is, is something that as Anna was saying we kind of approached in very different ways. But I have um, a kind, kind of couple of points. One, in one thing that um, struck me was that the kind of knowledge creation, the kind of epistemic effort of creating new conventions. For instance, you might say, for instance, the conventions of weather mapping that are actually created very much in the late 19th century are expressed through newspapers and therefore have a national, um, a national very often a national um, way of representing. In many ways, to me, it looks like as the beginning of creating a lacuna. So in the same moment in which you start creating new way of uh, expressing knowledge, you create also the opposite way. You create a new way of thinking uh, uh, creatively, uh, of thinking, we use the word novelty, uh, and indeed to, uh, to allow the, that imagination to run and create perhaps an imaginary, although there's slightly different, different things. So the relationship between the, the two uh, I think is, is, a, is an interesting one that has been examined in very different ways in different, in different papers. Um, the other thing, um, and I, I, I again I echo what Anna was saying, uh, the specific location being in uh, a library but also in a center that relates to maps uh, and having colleagues also from a variety of disciplines considering very different methodologies, but also very different what a historian would say, different sources, uh, and so going into literature, but going into also meteorology, going into a more theoretical understanding of things, and, and the variety of material that we have covered from uh, the world of, of you know, the Brontes to uh, the ephemera uh, that we had yesterday in the keynotes. I think that um, allowed, I think, a, a span, a breadth, uh, uh, of points of view that I think is quite unique that can only be achieved in a place like this in many ways. And that I think is uh, part of the, of, the, of the success. And of course, I would like to thank in particular Karen and Martin because they uh, have been really the driving force here at Stanford uh, in, in making all of this possible. And it is the conference, the intellectual stimulus that we had, but also what you see in terms of what the 
the center, and I think very much that, of course, the, the center and its director, um, um, allow all of these is a wonderful combination of things that I think has allowed us over a fairly short um, amount of, of time, uh, just one day and a half, really to achieve a lot. Uh, I learned a lot, for sure, but also I think my imagination has been rekindled. Great. Uh, so I have uh, just a couple of things to add. Uh, first, uh, I also wanted to uh, thank Karen Wiggin, uh, who's been primarily the person connecting with the center, and the whole team uh, for allowing this fantastic partnership. So this has been wonderful. Uh, and the second thing, well, two and three are kind of related. Um, I, I want to thank all the participants because you really um, enriched the center and uh, that's that's fantastic so uh, you know and the thing I think uh, the little thing it's not little but the thing that will go on for a little while is all your intellectual contributions that are on our walls right here so that will go on for another five months at least and then hopefully we'll put it up on uh, on the internet um, as a companion but uh, I, I, I just wanted to make sure to mention that as well so thank you and I would like to especially thank the participants whose native language is not English and or who flew from far away to be here. We in Stanford don't usually think of ourselves as being at the center of an empire or, <laughs> you know, we're not quite Paris or London, but uh, we have just experienced what it must feel like to be in the metropole of a big intellectual enterprise. And I, it, it must take a great deal of work fighting jet lag and a second or third or fourth or fifth language. Um, thank you so much because without your expertise, these beautiful images would just be beautiful images. We wouldn't know how to read them. And that deep cultural literacy that it takes to understand a map uh, is one of the biggest gifts that you've given us. I haven't had the energy to take notes because I'm totally absorbed in what I've seen. So I'm really glad you all left us papers as well. <laughs> and I hope that people in the audience who are interested in following up on any one of these will approach the author. They are the ones who can give permission, but all of these have been drafted and let's hope they see the light of day for a wider audience at some point. feels like maybe with that we should pull this to a close, although it's painful to end. <laughs> I've really enjoyed this enormously, and I think everybody else has too. Final kudos to Charlotte, who has really <laughs> carried a heavy load pulling all this together. And to all of you. Thank you.